All right, this next topic, power factor correction, is extremely useful. This is a very real and applicable topic. Right? Power factor correction is where we want to increase the power factor without altering the voltage or current that goes to our original load. Right? Why might we want to do this sort of thing? Well, if I have, to begin with, let's say, an inductive load, which might be a motor. Right? We'll talk a little bit about motors in the next couple of chapters. But when you're talking about a motor, it's essentially a big coil of wire. It generates a magnetic field, and that makes the motor spin. Right? So it looks like a big inductor. And of course, there's some resistance as well. Right? Because just real life, there's always some resistance. So if I have this, I have a voltage across this inductor, and a large current flowing through the inductor, I should say, OK, that's pretty good. right? However, I'm not going to get the maximum utilization of my power by adding a shunt capacitor, a capacitor in parallel with this. I can improve the efficiency, if you will, of my circuit. I can get the same current flowing through this inductor, and yet I'll actually reduce the power that I have to supply. How does that work? Conceptually, it actually makes quite a bit of sense. Think about that tank circuit that we've described before, where I have an inductor and a capacitor in parallel. Right? We saw before that an inductor and capacitor in parallel, they just oscillate with no decay. What was happening is that the energy stored in the inductor as a magnetic field, right, in, when there's current flowing, transfers over to an electric field, right, by the stored charges on the capacitor. So when the inductor is at a low point, not using power, the capacitor is actually at a high point, storing lots of power. So when the inductor wants to go back up in its cycle, the capacitor acts like an extra battery and feeds energy into the inductor. So on the down cycles of the inductor, the capacitor continues to draw power and store up extra charge. Then when the inductor needs it, the capacitor helps the original supply and keeps the inductor going and gets it, gets it moving a little bit easier. So we'll use this if you are running a motor, for example. Oftentimes there's a startup capacitor on a motor that the motor would build up some charge in a capacitor, and that would add additional current, because you need a lot of current at the beginning of for when you're using a real motor, it's something called inrush current. You need a lot of current to start things going, because you have to overcome all of the static friction. You know, this thing is just sitting there, and you've got to get it turning. Once it's turning, Inertia helps it keep moving, and it just keeps going a lot easier, and it takes a lot less current. But initially, you need a big spike of current. Well, that would mean you'd have to supply all of that current, which means bigger wires. It means a lot more power from your power company available to you to start the motor. But then after you're running, you don't need it anymore. So what a waste, right? You've spent a lot of extra money building heavy, heavy-duty wires, heavy-duty circuit breakers, just for a momentary utilization like a couple of cycles. Right? So why not put a capacitor? How do soft starts work? Soft starts? Yeah. On uh, the motor? Yeah. Probably similar okay. similar type of a thing. And it may just, it may also, I, I'm not sure, I, with some of them, they slow, at least like the motor controller like I have on my motorcycle out here, the soft start function on that is actually controlling the voltage oh, okay. that's coming in. So that's to prevent acceleration happening too fast. So in this case, this is to get you going and prevent you from drawing so much current that you would overload your system. The soft start on the motorcycle, at least, is so you don't throw yourself off the motorcycle. Okay. Um, because electric motors make all of their torque at low RPM. They're opposite to an internal combustion engine. So regular motor on your, like on your car, you've got to get the RPMs revved up pretty high before you get all your, your maximum acceleration to your tires. 
Electric motors are the opposite. Electric motors make their, the, have the strongest applied force at no RPMs. That's when the magnetic field pulls the hardest, okay. right? So, if you don't want to pull that hard because you might snap something in half, right? It's kind of kind of the opposite, in, in almost in a, in a way, functionally at least, right? To avoid putting so much mechanical force into something because of that high torque at startup, you soft start. So it applies a much lighter voltage, which means you have a much smaller torque initially, and then gradually lets that ramp up. So it slowly accelerates, and you don't just wham, snap, and you, you, know, you might snap your shaft in half or something if you hit it too hard with that initial torque. And then once it's up and running and it's applying less torque, you, you increase the voltage to keep accelerating and get, your up, and get your max speed up. Because the final speed of a motor depends on its voltage. So, yeah. so this is a power correction. The soft start would be more of a mechanical correction. Um, and in that, at least on mine, it's an electronic control. So it's actually, again, because this isn't changing the voltage. So on the, on the soft starts, as long as we're talking about the same thing, soft start is actually usually, in our case, it's a solid state circuit that chops the voltage down to a much more reasonable average voltage value, and then, then it lets it go up from there. So it does something like, kind of like pulse width modulation. It cuts the cycles up and gradually increases cycle until you reach maximum value. So. And that's tunable. You can adjust it. But power factor, so let's let's talk back about power factor correction. Why, you know, how does this really help us? Again, economically, this is really useful. And it's not just the amount of wiring that we need to include, right? It's also how much power we need to draw from our power company, right? Um, so if I'm looking at an initial load, right, I can draw its power triangle, right? There's this is an impedance. There's some voltage and there's some current, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm scared about wires. I don't. I don't understand like, the purpose of the power triangle. The power triangle is just representing complex power okay. on the imaginary plane, uh, right? So that the real or the real power is the x, you know, the x-axis, the real axis. Yeah. And the imaginary component of the reactive power is the vertical axis. And so the reason we want to use the power of triangle, in fact, this is where we're going to use it. Before, we were just drawing the complex power as a vector in the complex plane. But now we actually are going to use that to do something. Because the real power is what's actually doing the work. That's, you know, that's power being dissipated. So that's actual work being done like in our motor, for example. Right? And so that's the piece that's most important. The reactive power is imaginary. And so the triangle shows us how much of our total complex power is being made up of imaginary power. And that's not really doing work for me. That's not the power that's actually making my motor turn. Right? So if I wanted to keep the same total power, yeah. Sorry, that's okay. What is reactive? What exactly is reactive power? Is like potential or something? Yeah. So it's it's this idea that if I have energy built up in my magnetic field of my inductor, right? That magnetic field is sucking current through the coil because it doesn't want to change, right? In the case of a motor, a motor is a great example because in the case of a motor. Where does that energy go, right? Like, how does the motor actually turn something? Well, it's because the magnetic field, right? If, so you'd have a, you'd have some set of coils. Like I said, we'll see motors in a little bit more detail in a later chapter. But you'd have some sort of coils, and then you have some sort of a rotor inside, which you can imagine as another coil, right? So if this is the rotor's magnetic field. Then through these stator coils, you have another magnetic field. The B fields want to line up with each other, just like the poles of a magnet. So imagine this is just a north-south magnet, and this is another north-south magnet that sits in between. 
right? Or you could do this with permanent magnets with like a horseshoe magnet that has the north and the south pole, and then put a little bar magnet in the middle. And which way is it going to line up? It's going to line up with the magnetic field, right? Um, so the magnetic fields want to align. So it's going to try to pull into alignment. It's going to start a rotation. Well, that takes kinetic energy, right? That takes actual energy. Where does it get that from? It actually sucks that energy out of the magnetic field. That's, that's potential energy that's stored up, right? And so that magnetic field literally pulls it, and the pull of the magnetic field reduces as they align. So that, because that potential energy has now become kinetic energy moving it into alignment. Well, the, once they're, if they're in alignment, that's going to change the magnetic field felt inside the coil, which changes the current. So when we apply current, we force a magnetic field, which forces this to move. When this moves, it tries to change the current flow inside of the circuit. And anytime current is flowing, are changing in and out, we're dissipating power. Because there's always some real, there's always some real power, right? Because there's always some resistance. So our wire, at, of the huge wire that's wrapped up to make our motor, has some kind of resistance in it. So we're gonna lose power constantly because we have to apply more current to get a stronger magnetic field to pull the rotor. And so how much of that current is flowing in the inductor how big that magnetic field is, is exactly, it's the potential for doing work on the actual rotor. As the rotor turns, that magnetic field potential has become kinetic energy instead. And as the, and then for a simple motor, like a simple DC style motor, right, this would rotate through by inertia. Because once it starts rotating, it wants to keep rotating. And so then it's going to rotate through and the magnetic fields don't align anymore. And now they want to align again. And so energy is expended to get those magnetic fields to line up again. So it's before it rotates as the potential? And even as it rotates each rotation, it uses some energy to pull it again. And then you can imagine if I grab this rotor by having a, a shaft attached to it, right? And I put some kind of heavy thing on the end or some bearing with friction, or whatever it is I'm trying to actually turn, right? as this thing goes, it's also losing energy to the friction in my, in my mechanical system. And so every time it rotates around, the magnetic field has to add back in that energy to get this rotor to move again. And so that energy is being lost constantly to the mechanical friction and being added constantly by the potential energy of the magnetic field, which comes from the current that's flowing. So my motor keeps drawing current, more and more and more and more current. So is there a formula to like have to say how much extra potential is needed to overcome the friction? You, yes, you can calculate that. That's right. So you would, you would need to know your specific system you're talking about, mm -hmm. and then you would make a relationship that, okay, so much, you know, so much torque needs to be applied by the motor to overcome the resistive torque. All right, so torque is a friction, or friction in a shaft or a rotating system is a torque, just like friction of something sliding on a surface, yeah. right? And it depends on the speed at which something is rotating. And so you can look at it just like almost like a shock absorber on your car or something like that, but it's just, it slows down. And the faster you try to make it go, the harder it tries to slow you down, right? And so that is equivalent to, that's some torque it's applying to stop you. And if that torque keeps, you know, if that torque can't be overcome by the torque that the motor can apply, and that depends again on how much voltage and current that motor is capable of drawing. Heavier windings can draw more current, and more windings will create a larger magnetic field, and then a larger voltage you put on them is a larger amount of work that it can do because the power you can, the power that your motor supplies is I times V. So the bigger the motor is, it's literally just heavier gauge wires that can handle more current and more windings of it. And more windings, of course, increases the length, which increases the necessary voltage. So to get more power out of the motor, you need higher voltage and higher current. And the motor gets bigger and heavier. So you have the power to overcome like the... It just sits the there. 
So it wouldn't damage the motor, it just wouldn't do anything? Motors, right, so motors, the only way it will damage a motor is that motors typically don't expect to draw maximum current all the time. They expect to draw maximum current for a short period of time once, because once something is moving, the friction drops. If you guys remember back to physics class, you might have tested that out a little bit. You might have done static, static friction and sliding friction in one of your labs in like PS15 or something like that, right? That I have to push, 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 it doesn't move, and then boom, it moves, right? And then, and then it goes. So if you measure the, the force applied, there's a peak and then it falls off. Once things are moving, sliding friction or rolling friction is much less than static friction. And so typically a motor is designed that it's only going to need to apply enough its maximum torque to overcome static friction for a couple of seconds. So it can build up a lot of heat because the power is flowing, right? Lots of current is flowing in those windings. But then it's going to back off. And so it's going to be able to cool down. So the only problem is when you can't overcome the, that torque, the friction of the shaft, it will continue to apply maximum current. If the windings are not designed to dissipate all of that thermal energy, they'll melt and you'll burn out your motor. And so that's what happens when you burn out your, your motors. Is you just, if you grab the shaft, it doesn't do anything mechanically to it. You can completely stop a motor, which is very different than an internal combustion engine, right? If you stop the shaft, if you seize the shaft on your car, your car will need a complete engine rebuilt most of the, most of the time, right? Because those massive, you know, heavy mechanical pieces inside suddenly can't move, and you'll throw a rod or you'll blow a piston out or something really bad is going to happen, right? Because there's a lot of mechanical force. In the electric motor, you can grab that shaft. So electric motors, um, they will tell you what the stall torque is. And so the stall torque is just that. It's the measurement of the maximum torque that the motor can apply. Beyond that, it's not going to move. Right? So if you apply that much torque to it, it just stalls, which just means it just doesn't turn. But there's no mechanical connection. You're just going to draw maximum V, maximum I. If your motor is designed to handle that or it has some cooling, it'll just sit there, no problem. You can stall it all day long, keep flowing that current through it, and it'll just wait. And then as soon as you release it, the shaft, boom, it'll just rev up again. It's really just an issue, though, that is usually a lot more expensive. And it's a lot heavier. You're just using more copper to make more wires. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, in fact, um, for, for both this and then as we get into like three phase and everything, we'll talk about the reality of moving to these better power transmission systems. It saves you money because it saves you on your physical cost of copper. Right? And so power factor correction, give me just a minute to, to walk through this. Um, that's a very good question, though. So I don't mind taking a little bit of time to cover it, but I know we're close, but I, this is our last topic of the chapter, so I just want to hit it real quick. Um, so power factor correction, the whole point of power factor correction is to take my power triangle, Q1, and get it closer to being purely real. So if this is an inductive power triangle, because it's positive Q, by adding a capacitor in, I'm actually adding a negative reactive power to my system. Because capacitors go negative, right? So the positive from the inductor adds to the negative of the capacitor and reduces the height of my power triangle to this new Q2, right? And I can use this triangle to figure out by how much, right? So I don't want to change the real component. So if I have a complex power from, from my initial S1 that you see here, there's an apparent, you know, the real power is. S1 apparent power times the cosine of the original you know, angle, theta 1, that came from the inductive load. Right? But then I'm going to add some capacitor. I don't yet know what the capacitance value is, but I do know it applies some reactive power. Right? And here's the equations for it. You can find the reactive power in that capacitor right? By, because we're looking, you know, we're looking for the difference between the initial and the final. So we can use this to solve for the capacitor value that we want. So I look at what my initial, my initial reactive power is, my final reactive power, right? Reactive power is the apparent power times the sine, right? which is then the real power times the tangent, 
can make a substitution, right? And then knowing Q1 and Q2, which is my target, I can plug these in. And how do I do this? Typically, what's done is a target power factor is defined. You may say, oh, this has an initial power factor of 0.75. I'd like to get this to a power factor of 0.95. So plug in, you know, you start with an angle that yields a power factor of 0.75. You want to end with an angle that yields a power factor of 0.95, and that tells you by plugging into this formula, right, what value of reactive power you need from the capacitor, and then you can calculate what that actual value of capacitance you need is given the particular voltage that you're applying in the circuit. So basically this says if I have a great big inductive motor, I can figure out how big of a capacitor I would need to put in parallel with it to bring its power factor close to one. Ideally, we want to have all of our power factors as close to one as possible. Again, we're letting the capacitor act like an extra battery to source current into our supply so we don't have to use as much current, as much peak current and voltage. Because now, what happens to my complex power and my apparent power? If I get down here, this vector is shorter than my initial vector. So the apparent power is smaller. Well, apparent power is VRMS times IRMS. So if I initially had 120 volts coming out of my wall, and I needed 10 amps to get my motor going, I needed 1,200 volt amps to get my motor running. 